uh, I want to talk today about Plato's dialogue Phaedrus. Uh, and it would be normal to begin by saying something about you know, what that dialogue is about. Um, in the case of the Phaedrus, that's actually a little bit tricky. And that's because uh, in the Phaedrus, Socrates and the person he's talking to, Phaedrus, uh, talk about a range of different topics. And it's not obvious how they fit together. And so you're, with the Phaedrus, one of the things you have to do is ask, like, how does this dialogue fit together? Uh, and that's especially uh, striking in the case of this dialogue because that issue of how a text fits together is one of the central themes of the dialogue. The dialogue begins, more or less, uh, with Phaedrus reading a speech by Lysias. And later on in the dialogue, uh, Socrates says, hey, was that a good speech? Uh, did, did those pieces fit together in any way, or was it just kind of arbitrary? And he asks Phaedrus to kind of analyze Lysias' speech. Uh, and in the course of that, uh, Socrates says something about what a speech should be like. At 264c, Socrates says a, a speech should be like a living creature, right, where the different parts fit together in a kind of an organic way, all serving the same purpose and, you know, allowing the animal to function. Uh, and he says basically the same thing again at uh, 276a. He says you should have a living, breathing discourse. The, the issue is, is raised there then that in a text, the different things that come up, if it's a good text, uh, those things should work together in a sensible way to bring about a single powerful result. And when you read the Phaedrus, you think, hmm, does it do that? Why? Because the, they, the topics they talk about, um, you know, though it makes sense in the flow of the conversation that they go from here to here to here, it's not clear that they fit together to make this, you know, a coherent book. So they begin by talking about sexuality. Um, then they start talking about rhetoric, right? The way people use words to kind of get you to believe things that might or might not be true. Uh, and then they talk about uh, techne or science, right? Having, having expertise in something. Uh, great topics, but what does scientific expertise have to do with sex? What does rhetoric have to do with sex, right? And why, why would you, those things go together? So, in, in a, I mean, so the dialogue is about all of those things. But I think in a way, what the dialogue is really about is how all of those things go together. And so in reading it, that's the real thing that we have to be working on and learning about through thinking through those issues along with the dialogue, right? What it, what it is that rhetoric, basically the power to persuade people through words, what that has to do with sex, the, the way we're revved up in our bodies with excitement about an, another beautiful person or something like that. Uh, and with the issue of techne or science, the way that through our experience, we come to learn, you know, what reality is or how something works in such a way that we can abstract and isolate the central lesson that we've learned and, you know, put it in words or whatever, put it in a formula that we can then teach to other people and, and hand down, right? Those are the things we've got to be thinking about and we'll ultimately be thinking about how they come together. And the key to that, uh, is basically going to be that those are all distinctive dimensions of human experience, right? To be a person is to be involved in those issues of persuasion, sexual attraction to other people, and knowledge and science. And indeed, at the center of the dialogue, there is an investigation of the nature of the human soul. And it's really going to be by taking the insights of that and putting them together with what we learn by looking at these phenomena of sexuality, rhetoric, and techne, that we will be able to extract the most powerful lessons from the Phaedrus. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and so I'm going to just go, go through the dialogue. And I'm going to begin now by just talking about the opening scene. So as I said, the topics covered in the Phaedrus are uh, kind of disparate because it starts with a discussion of sexuality. And, you know, sex is a particularly 
intimate way we have of being involved with other people. It's it's something very close to us. It's how we're close to others. And it's it's sort of quite intensely personal. And on the other hand, we're going to talk about techne or science, which is kind of the opposite. It's a very impersonal way of relating to things. And you know, rather than being sort of an the intimacy between two people. It's a kind of a detached way of relating to the world and, and indeed to other people. Uh, but also notice that, speaking of other people, the techne or science is really the way that sort of people as a whole, as opposed to individuals, have sort of learned how to deal with the world and developed a kind of collective knowledge, you know, that we sort of pass down. So those topics, it seems to me initially then are really at the opposite ends of a certain kind of spectrum really of how we deal with other people one is these extremely intimate and personal ways and individual sort of ways and at the other end it's this sort of impersonal detached and sort of collective way that we deal with our grasp of uh, the real independent world and so on uh, and then the other topic i said is rhetoric which is the persuasive use of language. And it's actually that theme of language that's ultimately going to connect all of these things. Because in the dialogue, Socrates is basically going to define language as the way one soul or one person is able to have an impact on another person. Uh, and so it's language we're going to see that's going to straddle that uh, distance between those two things. And uh, is going to be our route into understanding uh, the whole domain of how we interact with each other, the domains of how souls interact with each other. Uh, and so the, the dialogue begins with a contrast, a, a quite significant contrast of two very different ways of using language, which corresponds very much to this same contrast I just made between sexuality and science. The dialogue begins with a conversation between two friends, right? Which is like sex, it's a very intimate sort of personal thing. And then that, that conversation leads into the character Phaedrus reading a written speech, right? And the written speech, it's, you know, it's kind of like a textbook. Like if you have a science textbook or, or even a philosophy book or whatever, uh, it's a thing that's been written in advance and you're not actually there talking with the author and the author didn't know you were going to read it. It's, it's a kind of um, use of language to embody a message that can be communicated to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Right? So like science, it's, it's kind of detached and impersonal. And so the dialogue begins with a contrast between these two experiences of language that are you know very much analogous to this contrast between sexuality and science that I mentioned. Uh, so let's then just talk about that opening scene. Uh, you know, Plato's texts are ones where you really have to put effort in to understand them, and you have to follow sort of cues and clues that you get from the dialogue to engage in independent acts of thinking to be able to appreciate the things that then are said in the dialogue. But in the, the way a platonic dialogue reveals its power to you is if reading actually becomes a dialogue between you and the text. Right? The dialogue has to say things you have to think about them. And if you think about them, then you will find there are things in the dialogue that speak to what you've been thinking. Uh, but if you're not working on your own and you imagine that you can just sort of read the meaning off the page, you don't get that much out of them. Uh, I mean, you get something, but they're not, they're not nowhere near as powerful as they are if you engage with them um, dynamically. Uh, and if you do engage with the text seriously, you know, there's all kinds of funny things that happen. The characters contradict themselves. They make mistakes. Things are said that are obviously false, right? And your job as a reader is to notice those things and to be a good interlocutor for Socrates, or, or for the other guy, whoever it happens to be in the dialogue, uh, and maybe see that the way the conversation should have gone is different from the way it did, right? And it's by adopting that kind of attitude, as I say, that the book really starts to open up and it can start to teach you something. Uh, so 
I find, as I said, that to read these things is often very important to, for me to pay attention carefully to how the thing starts and to think, okay, what's going on there? Why did he start there? What's, what's, why did he begin at this place? So where does he begin? Right? He begins by saying, Phaedrus, my friend, where are you coming from and where are you going? Where from and where to? Uh, so the very first thing is a greeting. Oh, Phaedrus, my friend. So what can we notice in a greeting? You know, think what that experience is like. It's, it's a situation where, you know, you're out somewhere and you come upon someone you know who you hadn't been expecting, I guess, or even if you'd been expecting them. Uh, the situation is that in the presence of that person, or, you know, when they suddenly come on the scene, your recognition of them seems to call for some kind of acknowledgement from you. Right? And so the activity of encountering that person as a friend or as someone you know, th that encountering is, is sort of only completed by you saying, Hi! Right? By you saying, Oh, it's you, Billy, or whatever. Um, the greeting it is not uh, just a sort of polite, super-added thing to an experience. I mean, it can be. But in, a, in real sort of moving situations, the greeting is part of how you recognize and encounter the that other person. And so the, the point that I really want you to think about there is that the linguistic expression, hi, you know, saying something, expressing your recognition of the other person's presence isn't, you know, really rigorously separable from the act of seeing another person, right? To encounter another person as a person and to put into words that recognition are two ways of looking at basically the same experience, right? So uh, language and the recognition of another person are in those most intimate experiences part of the same experience, part of the same phenomenon. So that I think is a particularly powerful way to start by thinking about what's happening in a greeting. And again, let me add one more thing to that that's implied in what I already said. But, but I didn't underline it, and that is that greetings in those contexts aren't particularly deliberate. It's not like you think about it and plan it. It's almost like they're things that are spontaneously drawn out of you by the fact of that other person being there. Uh, so it's important, I think, to hold on to that understanding, that experience of what language is as you go through the dialogue and read a lot of talking about the nature of language and especially as I said when it comes time to contrast that with a very different kind of language use the, or the written speech. Uh, another thing about the opening greeting is Socrates then says in a pretty natural way to Phaedrus, you know, where from and where to. Uh, as we'll see that kind of question can be answered at many levels, right? There's kind of a immediate one like what physical location did you just come from? Which, what physical location are you going to, of course. Uh, but in a way, the dialogue is ultimately going to ask about the nature of the human soul as such. And so what we're going to see and think about human beings is that we really have to ask about ourselves as, as beings. Like, where did we come from? Where are we going to? Which is another way of saying sort of what is life about, right? What is reality about? So that question in its ambiguity is also something uh, that has to be held on to. But for the moment, I'll I won't focus on the ambiguity. I'll just focus on the straightforward part. You ask someone where they're coming from, where they're going to. Uh, that seems pretty natural, right? That in um, encountering another person, you kind of situate them in terms of their own actions, their own trajectory. Uh, this particular thing is quite interesting because that introductory thing mirrors very closely the beginning of a different dialogue, uh, the Lysis. Uh, a dialogue that's on quite a similar theme. This dialogue, at least in part, is about the theme of eros, certain sexual love, that sort of thing. Uh, the lysis is about friendship, or philia, another word that can be translated as love. And that dialogue begins with Socrates saying, here's where I was coming from and here's where I was going to. Uh, and uh, then a minute later, after Socrates has uh, narrated that to the reader, uh, he talks to someone who says to Socrates, where are you coming from? Where are you going to? It's a very similar uh, structure. Uh, 
a further interesting thing is that those two dialogues, uh, the dramatic settings seem to be dated at roughly the same time, uh, maybe, you know, somewhere 403, 405, 407 BC. It's not entirely clear in either case, but in this one, uh, the Phaedrus uh, Lysias, the speaker, is talked about as if he's a prominent orator, and that seems to have only really come to be the case around 403 or so. Uh, and the Lysis, again, for other reasons, the age of the characters and so on, seems like it was probably taking place around maybe 407 or something like that. So these two dialogues sort of begin in the same way, and they're both set a few years before Socrates' death. They're both about love in some sense. And then one last thing, when Socrates says in the Lysis where he was coming from and where he was going to, he says he was coming from the academy and he's going to the Lyceum, and he describes himself as being outside the city wall uh, near a particular spring, it seems like he's in almost the same place he's in in the Phaedrus. Uh, the Lyceum was a place outside the city walls, uh, sort of uh, natural kind of environment. Uh, near the river Elysis, uh, and Socrates was outside the city walking, I guess, by that river to go out to the Lyceum. In this dialogue, he's talking with Phaedrus, and they also, as it turns out, we find out in the next few pages, are outside the city wall walking by the river Elysis. Socrates and Phaedrus decide they're going to go talk about this speech that Phaedrus has, and Socrates says, okay, well, let's leave the path here and walk along the Elysis. Then we can sit down when we find the right spot. And they go, they, they walk down this path. Uh, various interesting things happen there. Uh, but anyway, uh, Phaedrus says to Socrates, tell me, is, isn't this the place where this thing happened and they talk about a certain myth? And Socrates says, no, uh, that place you're talking about, he says, that's two or 300 yards farther downstream uh, where one crosses the Elysis to uh, get out to the district of Agra. And he says, well, I think there's even an altar to Boreas, the guy the story is about there. And Phaedrus says, oh, I hadn't noticed that. Uh, and then they carry on, uh, they discuss a few more things, and then a little bit later, they get to where they're going, and Socrates says, oh, this is a beautiful resting place. This is at 230B. It's a beautiful resting place. The plane tree is tall and broad, the chaste tree, high as it is, is wonderfully shady, and since it is in full bloom, the whole place is filled with its fragrance. From under the plane tree, the loveliest spring runs with very cool water. Our feet can testify to that, they're barefoot. barefoot. Feel the freshness of the air, how pretty and pleasant it is, how it echoes with the summery sweet song of the cicada's chorus. And the most exquisite thing of all is the grassy slope where we can lie down and so on. Uh, it's this little paragraph where Socrates describes the uh, setting they're in, you know, very sort of poetic and, you know, sort of thrilled terms, the way any of us would do sometimes when we're out in a natural setting, we just think, well, wow, isn't this great? It's so nice to be out with the cool breeze and the nice sounds and so on. Very familiar thing. So notice, Socrates is walking in the same place he's walking in the Lysis. Uh, Phaedrus doesn't quite know what they are, where they are. And Socrates says, well, actually, I'll tell you where we are. He's quite familiar with the place. And then he describes in this sort of thrilled way how nice it is to be out in that setting, right? And then Phaedrus says, oh, uh, Socrates, you seem so out of place. Um, seems like you need a guide. Not only do you not travel abroad, as far as I can tell, you've never even set foot beyond the city walls. So 230C to D. Um, it's very odd. Uh, it seems like Phaedrus is the one who needs a guide. Socrates is guiding him. He, Phaedrus says Socrates seems out of place. Socrates seems extremely at home. Uh, and Phaedrus says, you know, it seems like you've never set foot out the city walls. Well, we know he has. In the license, he says he's in the same place. But also here, like he's telling you, oh yeah, no, that thing's over there. You know, he's demonstrating his obvious knowledge of it. What you see, it seems to me, from Phaedrus here, in saying something that's quite obviously wrong is that he's projecting a certain identity on Socrates that doesn't actually fit with what Socrates is. So he says, Socrates, you seem out of place here. Where really, Socrates is 
showing something about himself that doesn't fit with Phaedrus's expectations. Right? So it's important to think about the contrast of those two things. Uh, and let me actually just mention one earlier thing. Uh, at, th at the beginning, uh, when Socrates was greeting Phaedrus, uh, you know, he says, you know, uh, where are you coming from, where are you going, and, and uh, Phaedrus says, and then Socrates said at 277b, what were you doing there? Um, or, I mean, maybe I, maybe I should put a more innocent tone on it. Oh, what were you doing there? Uh, it's quite natural to ask people questions like that. But notice that a question like that could also be sort of invasive, like, what business is, what business is it of yours, what I was just doing? And I guess that's sort of highlighted in this text because this opening discussion, I mean, the dialogue as a whole has a lot to do with sex, but this opening discussion in particular is just filled with sexual innuendo. And so when he says, you know, what were you and Lysias doing there? You know, it, it sounds like um, a question that could be a, a kind of invasive prodding into someone's private life. Um, I don't know whether it is or not, but the thing I wanted to bring out there is you know, as I said, this opening discussion is a kind of presentation of conversation, and it shows you something about how we normally, you know, use language in living interaction. And it's not just innocent how we use language. Language isn't just the seamless, perfect uh, meeting of minds and so on. Language, as you can see from this, you know, very small example, is something that can inappropriately cross boundaries. It can put pressure on people. It can be inappropriately entering into that space between two souls and so on. Uh, and I want to connect that with uh, that remark from Phaedrus where it seems that he's sort of projecting a false uh, portrait onto Socrates. Uh, I want to connect that with, with one other theme. I said at the beginning when I was talking about greetings that um, you know, when the other person is present, that's these words just sort of come out of you and so on. But I'd like you to think about that expression I just used, when the other person is present. Weird thing about another person is there's an organism present to you, a body. But the very nature of encountering that as a person is that you recognize the thing that's there isn't just an organic body it's it's a soul like it's a it's an inside it's a perspective it's someone with a point of view and so on and so when another person is present the thing that's present to you a perspective is actually something that you experience as in a certain way not present or, or absent from your experience right the the thing about another person is you don't know their inside unless they tell you or unless they show you uh nobody can be inside you experiencing your experiences you can't be inside another person experiencing their experiences and so when another person is present you realize another person can't really be present exactly right? and indeed that's how the Fido begins by asking you know were you present yourself the, the day Socrates died and the, the Fido kind of focuses on that issue of yourself or himself or itself and that notion of presence and brings out very much the same thing that the nature of a self is that it's never a thing that's actually just sort of present in the way, you know, a body or a thing is present at some location. Anyway, so I bring that out because that's kind of what you see in part with that remark from Phaedrus that even though he's there with Socrates, Maybe he's not really there with Socrates. He the the thing he's there with is his sort of projection of Socrates. And he doesn't really, maybe at some level, get Socrates. Doesn't doesn't really know who that Socrates is, who is there enjoying the grassy slope, listening to the song of the cicadas. Uh, and in a similar way, when Socrates is asking Phaedrus, you know, what were you doing there? Like it's just a reminder that you don't know what was going on with that other person. And even though uh, Phaedrus is there and he tells you where he's been and where he, wh what was going on there, it remains a certain kind of a mystery. And in your talking about it, you are dealing with that non-present dimension that is the other person's, you know, intimate life. 
and you could invade that inappropriately by asking the wrong questions. Or, of course, on the other hand, if you didn't greet the person, if you just acted like there was just a lump of flesh walking past you, that would be treating the other person, your friends, intimate inside wrongly by not even recognizing that it's there and needs to be greeted. So anyway, those are some of the things, it seems to me, that are thematized for us uh, in this opening uh, section. Uh, and let me uh, make one more remark about that setting that uh, Socrates seems very familiar with and, and that the dialogue draws so much attention to. I just want to mark something that's brought out here. He says about this setting that they're in, oh, he's hearing the cicadas chorus. So he announces the presence of the cicadas buzzing. And right after that, he, you know, in a slightly different context, makes a remark that uh, for some reason, you know, you, you can lead hungry animals by showing them food. But Socrates says, you can lead me wherever you are, not by waving a leafy branch with fruit on it, but by waving the leaves of a book at me. Because I love speeches and discourses and that sort of stuff so much that it, you can lead me somewhere by the promise of uh, listening to a speech or something like that. I, I mention that because it, he that's the last thing he says here before they then move on to the next thing, which is introducing us to Lysias's written speech. Uh, and there, there's going to be, the next section of the dialogue is going to be three speeches and a lot of content and so on. But at the end of that section of speeches, Socrates is going to go back and talk about the setting again, and once again specifically refer to the cicada's song and re refer to this issue of animals eating and people eating how people are nourished through you know things like language and arguments and so on so in a way that exactly parallels these images here so i'll, I'll mention that uh just then about the setting uh and then i want to say one last thing uh about this introductory portion before moving on then to talk about the speeches uh, and that is going back to this remark that phaedrus uh made you know he says you're out of place and so on uh anyway socrates right after that says at 230 d um my, forgive me, my friend, I am devoted to learning. Landscapes and trees have nothing to teach me. Only the people in the city can do that. Uh, and so when Socrates says that, you might think, on, on the face of it, probably Phaedrus does think, that he's just saying, oh yeah, right, I don't like it out here in the woods. It's not, that's why I never come out here. But but that's not right. I mean, he does come out there. That That can't quite be right. But the specific thing he says is that um, people can teach him something. Landscapes and trees can't do that. But interestingly, at a number of other places throughout the dialogue, he is going to say some things that landscapes and trees apparently can do. Just not exactly and specifically teaching, which, as we will see, is specifically associated with the notion of techne. Uh, and so I'll just uh, draw your attention to a few other things that come up. Uh, at 275 uh, B and C, basically, uh, Socrates uh, tells a different story. He says, um, the priests of the temple of Zeus at Dodona say that the first prophecies were the words of an oak, a tree that spoke, right, the words of an oak. Uh, he says, everyone who lived at that time, not being as wise as uh, young ones are today, found it rewarding enough in their simplicity to listen to an oak or even a stone, so long as it was telling the truth. I mean, he's telling a story, and you might think, well, I don't quite know what it means to say that a stone is telling the truth, and you may not really believe the priests of Zeus at Dodona. That's all fine. But the thing that Socrates is nonetheless doing is alerting you to uh, the idea that there are situations in which people do talk about landscapes and stones speaking. Uh, and that's related then to a few other things that come up. Uh, at 238C to D, after one of these speeches uh, has been made, uh, Socrates says, wow, don't you see there's something amazing about this place? Uh, there's something really divine about it, and it seems like I've been inspired by it. So there, again, it's not a matter of someone 
teaching him, which is uniquely related to a specific thing people can do in the context of techne, but it turns out he can be inspired by the place, and that seems pretty significant. And then again, uh, a little bit later, at 242C, when uh, Socrates says, oh, you know, I was thinking about crossing the river and leaving, but then I stopped, and he said, you know, sometimes uh, I hear this uh, familiar kind of sign I get. It's this voice speaks to me and says, you know, don't do that thing you're going to do. Well, he's, he, uh, he says that's what happened here. Uh, he says, my friend, just as I was about to cross the river, the familiar divine sign came to me, which, whenever it occurs holds me back from something I'm about to do. And then he says, I thought I heard a voice coming from this very spot. So again, Socrates himself, in describing his own experience, effectively says, oh, there are stones speaking to me. Uh, being the voice of that divine sign, telling me not to do something. So, you know, when he says this thing about, it's only in the city, that people can teach me uh, rather than hearing that as him saying oh yeah you should stay in the city I think you should focus on that as him saying oh there's a difference between a couple of things in the world of city life and sort of organized human behavior there are sciences and techne and teaching all extremely important that's to be differentiated from something else and that's the thing that's happening in his relationship to stones and trees that have to do with them being able to inspire, uh, speak, and so on. We want, we want to think about that idea a bit, what a, a sense of stone speaking. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, just to complete that point, is that notice too, Socrates is, you know, in nature, more or less, like they're out in a grassy slope with trees and uh, cicadas buzzing and stuff like that you know in, in the straightforward way in which we speak about things we'd say they're out in nature but remember in fact he's in nature uh outside the city walls on the way to the lyceum uh, uh and there's a mythological story about what happened there and the there's a temple or a statue uh, monument to boreas there and so on so the world of nature he's in, or the part of nature he's in, has itself already been sort of encoded by or interpreted by human languages and human institutions. Right? And so, you know, we were mentioning a minute ago how maybe stones can speak, right? how language can come out of them. But notice also just that he doesn't have a pure experience of nature. He has... And even though he is out in the natural world as opposed to being in the city, he's still in an experience that's kind of interpreted through humanity, human culture. And the evidence of that is these myths and the altar and so on. Uh, and so the, the last thing then that I want to say about that, just to complete that, is here then you get a contrast of the city and nature and language is something that is not contained in either one of those and it's not reducible to those terms rather language somehow seems to supersede or go beyond uh, what either of those two worlds offers but if you go back to the greeting with which i started language comes out of you, I was, I was trying to emphasize, in, like something completely natural. It's very natural to us to speak. As Aristotle says, we're the animal with logos. Like, our nature is to give voice to things. So language in that sense seems very much like part of nature. You might think, oh, yeah. you might think that's natural. And yet, language is such an artificial thing like it has to be made up by people language doesn't grow on trees different societies make different kinds of languages and it's in and through language that we develop all kinds of things that go beyond and outside of nature so in that way language seems more like the world of the polis and techne and artificiality right? and so if we operate with the normal very familiar distinction between nature and artifice the kind of thing you see at the beginning of uh, book two uh, of Aristotle's physics, 
uh, you can't fit language into that. Uh, language, in a certain way, is very much like the things of nature. In a certain way, it's very much like the things of artifice. But it's not containable in either of those two exclusive categories. On the contrary, it's got characteristics that seem to be like both of them, and in a certain way it overarches and exceeds that very um, distinction. A little bit later on in the Phaedrus, uh, after Phaedrus has read Lysias' speech, um, he's very excited about it and to express uh, how great it is. He uses this word, kuperfuos. And uh, I like that idea, it's supernatural. And I like that idea that language might be something huperfuos. It might be something that uh, is beyond the very meaning of what nature is. It may, it may be something we have to understand that ontologically speaking takes us beyond the categories of nature and beyond the categories of artifice and therefore takes us beyond that very opposition. So that's that it seems to me is some of what is introduced to us through this opening scene. And so now we can go on to look a little bit at their study of language.